Hey there, thank you so much for deciding to spend a few minutes of your day with me here today. I really do appreciate it. And today we're diving into the world of digital preservation and exploring a critical tool for safeguarding what actually could be the internet called ArchiveBox. Now, I wanna be very, very clear that this tutorial is meant to demonstrate how to archive data for historical preservation purposes. It is not meant to be used for any pirating or any other nefarious purposes. Again, this is meant to archive data for the sake of archiving and nothing else. So with that out of the way, let's talk about a recent event that highlighted just how vulnerable our digital heritage can be. As many of you know, the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library with the mission of providing universal access to all knowledge, recently suffered a major hacking incident. Now, this attack underscores the fragility of online information and the importance of taking personal responsibility for preserving the data that matters most to you. The Internet Archive is a treasure trove of digital artifacts from websites and software to music and videos. It serves as a historical record of the Internet, allowing us to look back on how websites and online content have evolved over time. But as we've seen, even well-established institutions like the Internet Archive are susceptible to attacks that can compromise valuable data. And that's where ArchiveBox comes in. ArchiveBox is a powerful self-hosted platform that allows you to archive websites and other online content. It's like having your own personal internet archive, giving you complete control over your digital preservation efforts. Think of all of the websites, articles, and online resources that are important to you. Maybe it's a blog post that inspired you, a news article that shapes your perspective, or a tutorial that taught you a valuable skill. With ArchiveBox, you can ensure that these resources are preserved even if they disappear from the internet. So if we take a look at my demo setup of ArchiveBox, we'll see that I've got a few of my own resources archived here, and we can see when each URL was bookmarked, the name of the page, the different files that were created for each of the different backups, the backup size, and the URL of the page that was archived. If we click on the title of any of these pages that we've archived, we can see the page that we've archived at the bottom of the screen and all of the different versions of that backup in the top panel. Now we can click any of these different versions in the top panel to see the different page captures. And we can toggle that top panel open and closed via the arrow next to the page name in the top center of the page. If we go back to our main dashboard, we're gonna take a look at the top bar. Now in the top left, there is a site logo and right below that there is a search feature. But if we go to the top right of the page, there are several links that we're going to take a look at. Starting on the outside and working our way towards the middle, there's an account and logout section. The account link will take us to a page where we can change our password, and that's about it. And the logout link does exactly that. It will log you out of the site. Docs will take you to the documentation on how to use the site over on the GitHub repository for the project. The public link will show us what the public will see if they're not logged in. And the admin link will take us to an admin page where we can do things like add or change users and view things like archive results, snapshots, and tags. We can also see the same results if we click on snapshots, tags, and logs in the next group of links in the top menu bar. And now we're going to get into the meat of why we're actually here, and that's the add link. On the add page, we get a big box where we can enter a single URL or a list of URLs, one on each line. Below that, we can change the URL format for whether it's an API or a list of URLs or an RSS, or for simplicity, we can just use the auto detect feature, and that's what I normally use. Below that, we can put tags in if we want a bit of extra categorization to the URLs that we're archiving. Next is the archive depth. We can either download the specific URLs that we've put in and leave it at that, or we can let it go another hop away from the URLs that we've put in. Now, using the depth equals one is a great way to archive a lot of data, but it will archive a lot of data. So be careful with that. If you wanted to download, say, just a single website, but not have it go outside of that domain, you're going to have to put in a little bit of work. And while this is actually a requested feature on the ArchiveBox GitHub page, they've come out and said that this isn't the purpose of the app. So if you want to just download a single website without going outside of it, you'll need to get a full list of the URLs of the domain, put them in the URLs box, and use the depth equals zero option. Or you can, as they suggest, find a different way to download the entirety of the single site. So that is one of the limitations 
or features of Archive Box, depending on how you want to look at this. Now, the last option on the ad page is the archive methods. If you don't select one of them, all of them will be used. And while this will be a more complete archiving method and get multiple different versions of this, it of course will take more time and more storage space on your server. Next, you can click the add URLs and archive button and wait until the archive is done. And then go back and view all of the archives like we've done earlier in this video. As we've seen, Archivebox is incredibly versatile and can be easily deployed using Docker. And this means that you can set it up on your own server or NAS without a lot of effort. So let's talk about the process of installing and configuring Archivebox using Docker. If we head over to the archivebox.io website, we can see a website that looks like it was archived from about 10 years or more ago, but maybe that's the beauty of it. So on this page, there's a bunch of information about Archivebox. Key features, for example, include things like being free and open source, having a powerful command line option, which we're not gonna get into, as well as comprehensive documentation and a lot of other features. I encourage you to take a look at archivebox.io and read through it to find more information about the app, different ways to use it, caveats, and lots more. As per usual, links to everything will be in the video description. So if we go to the quick start section, we can see a few different ways to deploy archive box, but of course we're going to take a look at doing this via Docker. Now they give a few different commands to run and you can do it that way, but I always like to at least look through the Docker Compose before I deploy it. Also, just, just a quick side note here. If we jump over to hub.docker.com, we'll see that archive box is capable of running on both desktop and ARM64 CPUs, but you may wanna check the compatibility of the other containers in this Docker Compose for compatibility for the rest of the setup if you plan on using an ARM configuration for this. Also, it is worth noting that images for both platforms are nearly a gig in size, so you've been warned. If we go back and open up the docker-compose.yml file linked on the page, we'll see a pretty lengthy file, but in fairness, a good chunk of the length of the file is documentation and other optional features and containers. Now, I've actually got this running just vanilla like it is right now, and it works great, but if you want to do things like remove ads from archive pages, run your system through a WireGuard VPN, or include a change detection uh, setup to trigger archive box to run those URLs again, you can do that with this setup. Now there are other options in the Docker Compose that I haven't covered here, but everything is really well documented in this Docker Compose. So be sure to read through it to find more information about each feature for yourself. Also be sure to update the CSRF trusted origins line to your domain for everything to work properly. Now you can deploy this either via command line or portainer, however you want, but by default, this setup does run on port 8000. So if you're using portainer, you will need to change port 8000 near the top of this Docker Compose to something else. And if this setup uh, conflicts with any other containers you might already have running on your system, you will need to account for those port changes as well. Now there are basically kind of two options for the setup process beyond what we've already covered. You can either set the default admin username and password combination in the Docker Compose, or you can run an additional script before deploying the entire Docker Compose. That's really kind of up to you. And this is documented in the quick start section of the archive box IO um, setup process under step three. Also, as things are downloaded, they will just be kind of dropped into the parent folder of wherever this Docker Compose is deployed unless you go through and actually change the mapped volumes in the Docker Compose, whether you're deploying this in, in a Docker Compose.yml command line fashion or via a portainer, you will wanna make sure that you uh, map those volumes appropriately, again, for your specific setup. And once you've got things to your liking, you can deploy the containers and then wait a few minutes because again, the archive box image is nearly a gig in size. After just a few minutes, you should be able to go to your Docker server's IP address on port 8000, unless of course you changed the uh, port of the container. At this point, you can log in with your admin username and password combination and start adding URLs to archive on your system. As we've seen, the internet archive hack serves as a stark reminder of the importance of digital preservation. And with archive box, you can take control of your online history and ensure that the information that matters most to you is safeguarded. So that is Archive Box kind of in a nutshell. I know there's a lot of stuff that I didn't go in depth on, but 
This could really be a very, very long video if I went through every possible thing that we could do with this. So I encourage you to go through the Docker Compose and all of their documentation to find the right setup for you. Again, so that you can archive the things that matter to you. Um, again, I want to reemphasize at the end of this video that this is meant for archiving purposes, for historical archiving purposes, not for any kind of nefarious business that you may think that it's funny to use it for. This is meant to be an informational tutorial, not any kind of, 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 of pirating tutorial. I don't want people to use this for that. And I, I feel it's very necessary for me to say that for a number of reasons. So I just, I wanna be very clear about that, but I would love to know what your thoughts are on using something like Archivebox. Are there other things that you've used besides Archivebox in the past that work well for you? If there are, I would love to know about that in the comment section down below. Um, definitely, um, if you can, go donate to um, the Internet Archive. They could really use some help. I can't, I genuinely can't imagine not only what their infrastructure looks like for the hundreds of petabytes of data that they've stored, but also their backup solutions and the infrastructure that manages all of that. Um, it's, it's, my mind just can't wrap around a setup like that. Um, but, but I would love it if you guys, if you can, if you could go donate to the Internet Archive to, to help them, continue to preserve what's going on online. But um, I think I think with that said, I, I'm gonna wrap this up. I wanna thank you guys for spending a few minutes of your day with me today, and I'll talk to you in the next video.